We're going to talk today about strategic planning, who should do strategic planning, why strategic planning is valuable, and what it's all about. Art, I'll start with you and ask who should do strategic planning and why? All of us should do strategic planning, large companies and small companies. Primarily, it's to make sure you recognize where your strengths are and where your challenges are. And if, and if you focus on that and say, how do we build these strengths and take advantage of them for the marketplace, but at the same time, how do we counter the weaknesses? But we have market opportunities out there, and if the company is not positioned to take advantage of those, they'll, they'll not grow like they need to. So the planning process is important to take a look at that, take a look at the company and move forward. I always wonder how you plan for you. Do you plan for a year? Do you plan for three years, five years? It is a um, wildly moving economy and things just move so fast. How can you plan for the future and how far in the future should you plan? Uh, oftentimes, it's a three-year plan. Um, the, the plan should have a strategy, but it also needs financials around it. Uh, whether you're a, uh, a large company or a medium-sized company, or even if you're just a startup, w which often starts as an idea, uh, which is a form of a strategic plan, uh, but then it needs uh, a lot built around it. Um, I find typically three larger companies will often do a five-year strategic plan. And, and for anybody, what are the components of a strategic plan? Depending on the size of the company, again, it could just be the entrepreneurial person at the top, although it's a lonely place to be. The more people you can get involved, the better. And if you don't have an executive team um, to have business resources and friends who can be a part of it. And my company, it's the executive team. Um, and then our components involve, again, a short-term strategy, maybe what we're trying to accomplish the next 12 months versus 36 months plus. Um, and within that, we do um, specific goals within that time frame. Um, an interesting component we've added recently is a supporting org chart. So of course, financials um, are involved as well as goals. And then we also do a SWOT analysis, um, as Art was discussing, the importance of seeing where their weaknesses are and can you do things to minimize them or, in great cases, eliminate them completely. Uh, why do so many companies not have a strategic plan? Because a lot don't. They'll say they do but it's not written, and is it important to be written? One thing I think that happens is, and we struggle with this constantly, is the urgent drives out the important in business. Mm -hmm. And we know how important it is to have a plan, but the phone rings, something comes up, something changes. And we try to have a written plan annually, but then constantly update it because things change. And as we try to put a plan together, we are small. There are a lot of things we absolutely cannot do. So what we, we attempt to do is try, do as Becky and Art and Peter alluded to, try to assess ourselves, assess the competition, and look at the market and see if there's an area where the market is being underserved and that we can com uh, develop some sort of competitive advantage so our bank can differentiate itself other on some basis than price. So that's what we constantly attempt to do that. While we'll do it written, it evolves because things changes, change and competitors change their focus, so we have to respond to that. Yuri, I know you advise a lot of companies, and uh, who gets involved in the strategic plan, and how far down does it trickle? Who needs to know what it is? Well, the person, the entrepreneur, the person in charge of running the, the business is who needs to know and probably can assess best if there is an strategic plan in um, a need for that. Um, I come from a, a kind of an initial background in, in film production and then now in the nonprofit sector. But then again, your, your script or your screenplay is, is basically your, your strategic plan. And we need to have that. And uh, I totally agree that um, the priorities of a small business owner sometimes are as running the business and it's hard for them to assess the weaknesses and the threats on the uh, SWOT analysis because that's what drives them to become entrepreneurs in the first place. Their drive to, to succeed, their confidence, perhaps sometimes overconfidence, but then it's very important to, to assess what are those uh, threats, what are those weaknesses in advance. Peter, you have a, a quite a pedigree when it comes to strategic planning. Can you walk us through some of either an example or some of the uh, challenges that people face in strategic planning? There's a huge difference between uh, being in a large company environment and being in a, a startup 
or uh, or even a slightly mature startup. Um, I've I've launched two e-commerce startup companies, and what I'd say about those environments is that um, you know the the initial chemistry amongst the people, the core group that is involved, is almost like a form of virtual strategic planning. Uh, hopefully, you have smart people. Hopefully, they know what they're talking about, and hopefully, they're orienting themselves in the right direction. Um, probably not a lot's getting written down, and it sometimes tends, especially these days, to be focused on technology. So how does the technology solve a problem or satisfy a market condition or otherwise? Um, it's, it's when the startup needs money that they're required and forced to put things down in writing. And when they're forced to put things in writing, they almost find themselves in a position where they have to do a strategic plan or a business plan, and there is a difference. I've found that by taking the time to write it down, it makes you accountable. We're going to grow by 20 percent, and then people start looking and asking you where you are. But then also to be comfortable and realize abandoning a project is just as important as implementing one. As if it's part of your strategic plan that you're going to do X, buy a company, sell a company, add a person, and you realize part way in, you've made a mistake. One of the, the, the mistakes people make, I think, is not being willing to abandon when they know they made the wrong decision. And part of that, having that plan in writing is to say, yeah, we were going to try this, but it's just, it's not working. Otherwise, the entrepreneur tries to make it work. They force and it they in. stay with it. I've been guilty that yeah. they stay with it too long because what's maybe got you to where you are is right. the fact that you will do what it takes to be successful. Well, and I think part of that when the, with the plan is to have key performance indicators associated with each aspect. So if it is grow revenue by 20%, either you're doing it or you're not. Okay. If it's uh, you know, anything that you, if you, what do they say, if you can't track it, you can't manage it. So as soon as there's an item on the plan and you're, it's gray or a gut feel only, which entrepreneurs tend to do, then I think you're at risk of potentially failing because you're truly not measuring how close you are to achieving that part of the plan. Is there an example of a company, maybe it's your own, that did really well with a strategic plan or a company that perhaps didn't? I've got one that, uh, and, and I'm sure we all do, but we helped an organization a couple years ago go through um, almost a crisis uh, strategic plan. And it wasn't that the business itself was in short-term problem, but their industry changed very quickly. Um, the dynamics of the business were such that they really couldn't take the time out to do a soft, easy plan, but they had to do it quickly and the board was really waiting on their recommendation. But in talking with them, we sat down and said, all right, we can do this over a six month period. Uh, what we'll do is meet one day a month, so you're still doing everything you do every day. They went through that process and it was, and I hate to use the word brutal, but they put a lot of time and effort into it. But they had it completed at the end of the six months. They took it to the board. The board signed off, and they started it January. And the first year was a success. And they really had reinvented themselves. But they all bought into the process of, it, of examining it, and, and they all bought into what they put together. Nothing passed unless it, they built consensus around it. And what's the advantage of bringing in an outside facilitator versus doing it by the leader? And how do you get the time off? Who has thoughts on that? I prefer that it's an outside facilitator. Absolutely. Sometimes the relationships, that the existing relationship between the members of, 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 of the group that you want to um, have participating in the strategic planning, it's better for someone else to, to come with and be, be, be known as an expert on the matter and guide the process. We've done it both ways, and when I led the strategic plan, I thought, oh, it's going to be so easy, and I'll go in there, and everybody will have a great discussion, and as tight as an executive team as you may have, if you sign the paychecks, they are going to pick up on what you want and, and try to make it happen. And I don't have all the answers. They, uh, the answers are out there. So when we changed and brought in a facilitator, then the tenor was, a, a, the tone was different. And I even met with the person before and said, your job is to shush me. Is I'm not supposed to speak because if yeah, I do, I understand. you know, and so I think it's so important to get that ego in check and not have to be the jack of all trades and leaving probably of, of the many processes that we do as leaders, running the strategic planning process is a dangerous one because everybody's going to help you make happen what you think should and you miss, might miss out on some great opportunities that just didn't filter up the top.
it goes back to the size of the organization, I think. And what happens is it bleeds. We've been in small companies, and we're a, we're a bank in a big industry, but having to be a small a small company. You've got strategic, you've got financial, and you've got annual plans, and they kind of all bleed together. But at the end of the day, the strategic planning has to come first because if you don't have the strategic part of it, you don't have the structure. Once you have the strategy, you can do the why and the why not and the how. And then that leads to the structure and the structure then goes to function, product, customer selection, things that Peter and the others spoke about. So um, be it big or small, that's what we try to speak through. And then we go to the examples which you spoke about, which are excellent. And is there a particular structure that works better when people are developing a strategic plan? And with that question, I might ask, what are the actual elements of a good strategic plan? Peter? Well, I, I'm a big believer in <clears throat> getting out of the office to do a strategic plan. I mean, I think it's great to get off-site. It helps people feel a little bit more relaxed and it breeds teamwork. Less distractions as well. Uh, I also agree with the, uh, the comments about a facilitator. The facilitators, a good facilitator, brings a different energy into the process, uh, not the typical working energy that you have amongst and, and sometimes politics that you have in companies. And they provide structure. And if they're good, they'll, they'll provide a structure that can help the executive team lead, lead to the answers. And one of the more sort of magical aspects of all this is, is helping people even define and understand what, a, what is strategy mm -hmm. comparatively to what is a business plan. What about small businesses that really are so busy and they might develop a strategic plan, but nobody is, you know, it's a working manager, it's a small shop. Who's going to drive that strategic plan, make folks accountable, and have you ever run into a situation where the plan just stayed on the shelf? I think if you, you know, regardless of the size, whether you're a one-person show or have, or a billion-dollar company, you have to be very intentional about looking at your plan on a regular basis. But then also having an, again, accountability partner, whether it's your spouse or your banker or a business friend, where you meet once a month and you say, I just want to bring my strategic plan and talk to you about it because then you're going to be held accountable. Training for a marathon is much different than training for a 5K race. So it, depending on what your plan is, if your plan is complete market domination, then that's, a, that's going to have a whole different approach. It's going to be longer than if your plan is to get five new big clients in the next 12 months. And so really being clear about what your objectives are, I think, are, is, is a key component in achieving them. I think also, in a, especially a smaller business, you've got to be careful that your strategic plan does not turn into a long-term plan. If right. it becomes a long-term plan and employees and people and customers do not see results and don't feel it's results-oriented, then it's just counterproductive on the morale, on the energy, and, and the whole ball of wax as far as that's concerned. But to me, it's important to know why you're in business, why, what gets you into business, what do you, what do you, what do you want to become, what do you want to take your business to? Do you have to be a creative thinker to develop a strategic plan? You need a team, I think, to develop that strategic plan. You need diversity around the table. You can get diversity with two or three people, or you can get much better diversity with 20 or 30, but it's, you know, I think an individual can think strategically, but to try to take an entrepreneur's thinking and put it down on a piece of paper as a strategic plan really is a shortcut to, to what you need. You get your team, and Peter, you were talking about it earlier, particularly early stage companies, the creative juices are very good. They don't typically write that down but if you take that and it guides that process, um, you know, I might like it white, you may like it brown, and somebody else may like it yellow, but you blend those together and you're going to have a much better plan going forward. The PC business has just dramatically changed very quickly. Some of them are well equipped for that, some of them are not, but you have to listen to the different folks around the table on what's happening where you can make those mistakes very quickly that, or that turn into problems very quickly. I do some work with the Salvation Army, which is a great group, and but they get focused on their works, not their business part of it. And we had done plans before, but we never really put them into action. And we hired an outside facilitator, and the fellow was really good, and he challenged us, and everybody thought it was a great thing to do. So, so my expectation was he'd probably help us put together a plan which might be pretty good going forward. One thing that I was surprised, the facilitator took it beyond the, 
the construction of the plan into through the implementation. He's actually still working with us, and the plan's been done for six months. Well, Roddy's got a great point, and organizations don't always, or not are, are not always comfortable having that follow up. But it, it will make a very good plan become very effective if someone does stay on it afterwards. So I applaud you all for doing that. I think there are also so many easy tools to use that. As you were saying that, Roddy, I began to sort of envision our role is really as the conductor. Mm -hmm. um, and so if the, if the people around you, whether they're one or 500, are the orchestra, Nobody starts until somebody raises and starts to get the music going. And so that conductor role is saying it's time to go. And you know, you can use tasks and alerts and things. And I do, I, I have I remind myself to look at my strategic plan once a month and then have a meeting with my executive team once a quarter. And if I didn't do that, I don't think we'd meet. We, you, you wouldn't just things will peter off or it'll be on the shelf, as you mentioned. Um, so clearly I think the leadership role is to make sure those meetings happen and it's that's a simple thing to do. Mm -hmm. That is not a complicated activity. What does a strategic plan look like on paper? Can it be a one-sheeter? Uh, is, it, is it a binder? Uh, how robust is a strategic plan? I have my one-page plan here. We have a combination of plans, so I've got a simple one-pager that's just color-coded that involves a series of items, and then we have supporting goals. So it can be a list of timeline we need to uh, you know, produce this level of profit by this time, which is more of a goal, whereas the strategic plan includes the SWOT and the mission and then the objectives short, long term and um, beyond. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I really do think it needs to be something, if it can't fit on one page, then it's probably more of a list of goals and, and more extreme than it needs to be. I like to see a fairly uh, deep analysis of the market and I think that that's so important because it's the environment that the business operates in, it's the landscape, it's, you know, it's what's happening. A lot of the, the plans I've been involved in and then uh, others that I've seen uh, that have been particularly effective come from a good market mapping where they, the folks really sit down and they know their business, they know their market, and they can see a hole, they can see an opportunity, and that's what they're driving towards. You know, there are a lot of very successful um, mid-size and small businesses where the CEO and everybody's working every day and they know what their business, but they really couldn't do a market analysis. Are there, is there any advice you would give to someone who might think, well, you know, I know what I do and I know what works, but I couldn't produce a market analysis? Yeah, look at the trends also, very important. You get to foresee, to have the ability to do a remote view uh, into that future the, where you want to take the, your business or your organization to. And sometimes that's something that we, yeah, we don't get to do much or people are not considering. They think that three-year plan is going to work in three years and things can be totally different. So you need to look at the overall picture of the, of the, of the, of the country or even the world, depending on what you do. It's, it's so easy and, and particularly entrepreneurs and private owners if you're doing well, you want to keep doing it. But, but the challenges that we all face today with the fast change, and again, all we have to do is look at the technology world. Both Dell, HP, all those guys have, have been doing so well for so long, and maybe they've made some other mistakes, but the key mistake they seem to have made is they didn't recognize the change in PCs. And so going back to Peter's point, if you're not watching your market, if you're not watching your competition, Somebody can come blindside you one day and, and things change. You have to look beyond what your own business is before you really know how to guide your own business. Um, but today it's even more important because years ago where we had a 10-year plan or 20-year plan, I think most of us are working 6 to 12 to 18 months not knowing exactly what's going to happen next door. That is such a good point and a great example because I know so many people, you know, I'm a small business and I have a lot of uh, friends, CEO friends of small businesses, and I say, well, you know, tell me about your strategic plan. And they say, you know what? My strategic plan is just keep doing what we're doing because we're just doing fine. <laughs> and so, but your point about being blindsided, if you do keep your nose to the grindstone and you just say, let's keep doing this because it works, uh, you just never know what's going on around you in the environment. So I think if you do the strategic plan correctly, too, there is a component that are those blows, blows to the bow where you take time and you say, let's talk about worst case scenario. 
let's talk about the crazy things that could happen, but if they did, would shut our businesses down. And then it's, creative ideas will come from that, um, and you will solve problems maybe you weren't aware of, and you'll also probably identify um, problems your competitors have that if you solve are no longer going to impact you in the competitive market. So really looking at what those, what those problems could be, even if they're minute, you know, even if they're out, you know, outrageous. The executive team goes off for a weekend or a day or a half a day for a strategic planning session. And I've heard, you know, employees say, oh yeah, the execs are off strategic planning, but we never know what they're doing. We don't know how it impacts us. Let's talk a little bit about how you drill that down and why it's important, or is it important for people to know the strategic plan, or is it just important for them to know what to do every day? I believe it's extremely important to be transparent and to balance again against your core values. Um, as an example, one of our core values that's on our mission statement is family first. Um, but I talked with an employee whose child was in the hospital, and we said, you know, of course, you do what you need to do. And his wife at the other end of this, at another business, was being pressured and called by her office, where are you, where are you, where are you? At the end of the day, where's the loyalty going to be or the production on my employee versus, her, versus the other companies? And we're doing it because we balance it against our core values. There's also bottom line payoff, without question, in that this person is, is extremely trustworthy and loyal and knows that we truly mean what we say when we say we balance our goals with our core values and look for conflicts and try to address accordingly. I think of situations I've been in, uh, I remember one in Silicon Valley where um, there was a meeting on a Saturday amongst the executive team and the strategy had to be put into place really fast because they were running out of money. And it resulted in a reduction in force of 75% and a complete reorientation of the uh, of the of the company in terms of its strategy, in terms of its technology, everything. They actually survived, but you know, in that case, you can't involve everybody. It's very difficult. Is there ever a disconnect where you're trying to be transparent, but not everybody either wants to know the financial situation. Let's just talk about the money. I mean, how much about the money can you share all the way through your organization? Well, when it gets down a few layers, it might not make sense unless you share the financials and what the, what, the, what the benefit is going to be. There are organizations that are very transparent with their financials from every, at every level. There are others that keep it very tight to the chest and if you change something quickly, it, I think it's going to upset the equilibrium. But, if, but a company that always shares financials, I think that's, you've got to keep doing it. And even bad news, you've got to get out there. If you don't share it, you've got to share the information another way. If you're going to change that, I think you've got to change it over a period of time and you've got to change it with a lot of explanation. But in part of that, from Becky's perspective, if you've got public company, financial is going to be pretty open. If you're a private company, most people tend to keep that pro pretty private, but there are a number of organizations we work with that are very open to that all the way to the end. I think, Becky, you are. You're, we have you're complete open, open financials. Years. Do you find that has made your strategic planning uh, easier, or more fruitful, more for me definitely because I'm not. I don't have to remember who knows what. I mean, really, at the end of the day, <laughs> right. it's like everybody knows everything. And right. then I think, you know, at a leadership level, it can be a lonely place to be, especially if you're also trying to keep secrets. You know, and f so for me personally, it just works to say, here the financials are, here are the objectives, here are the reasons why. Um, they may not agree, but if you have open communication with it, at least they're under, they understand and you're, they're dealing with facts instead of rumor. I think you can always figure out a way to slice the pie. Whether It doesn't have necessarily have to be net income or pre-tax. It can always be revenue growth. It can be margins. It can be departmental. It can True. be whatever, True. which right. gives them what they need. Right. Uh, following up on what Dan said, uh, when we did our plan recently, uh, Dan and I gave them some parameters for them to go back and look at their own situation. Of, because what we learned is, uh, we're interested in core deposits, and we're interested in getting great customers like y'all. We're interested in making loans, generating fee income, but not everybody is equally adept at all those. So we ask everybody to go back and look at their own book of business and come back with some growth numbers broken out by those units. And, and the only thing that we really we're fixed on is we want customer acquisition three to four really prime customers per year per officer. 
And what happened was, as we're doing the plan, the, the numbers started coming back, and they were higher than the numbers Dan and I were looking for. And mm -hmm. so when we roll out the numbers, they were either at or below all those. They felt they had buy-in. They felt they had committed to something that they could do without us pushing them. So we're going to attempt to do that going forward because it's the point we talked about. The level of buy-in, is, especially in a very small organization like ours, is really key to us getting any place. Can we talk a little bit about how in a large organization you can make a correlation for someone uh, in the in the mid area or the, uh, just in you know the day to day worker, what's the correlation between trying to achieve your strategic goals and what's in it for me? It's it's very important that people are incentivized to uh, to deliver their component of the plan, and uh, so so I'm a big believer in having a compensation structure underneath that plan that uh, pays out according to people hitting their objectives, but also pays out according to the company achieving its objectives. So I think it has to be a combination and tiered, and it has to be communicated so people can understand that if they do X, they will receive Y. And there's really nothing more satisfying than when a plan comes together and people feel a role, and they feel that they've been a participant, and they see their company doing well, um, that's perfect. That's just terrific. What part of strategic planning is the most um, fun and rewarding? If you have a diverse group around and you have good feedback, as you gather the thoughts, the ideas, as you go through that SWOT analysis, what do we do well as a company? Where are our challenges? Where are those opportunities and so forth? If you're, if you're getting, pulling that information, and you really shouldn't have to pull it, people will tend to want to volunteer it. If you pull that in, that's an exciting time because every, the energy is flowing. Whether we talk to someone who sees the client every day, either in the teller window or talks to the person on the phone, when you get their feedback, how do we improve our business? Is it communications with our client? Is it delivering the end product or whatever? That's the exciting thing, and I think that's what get, gets people really, really pumped up about making the plan work. So uh, what kind of things can we anticipate in the near and long future that w w those of us who work in the community can see about Nashville or the state or even an industry? You know? I'd love a list of people without strategic plans because I'll come out and swoop their businesses <laughs> up for cheap. <laughs> um, but, I mean, but I think, I think if people are still reeling from economic changes, you know, that, that those companies that have taken the time to plan will be situated much um, better than those who have not. And um, that there are gonna be opportunity for those who plan to take advantage of that in terms of buying businesses or seeing competition go out of the business.